A very warm welcome to our international uh, youth networks, our NGOs, researchers, students, and community knowledge holders and practitioners from different parts of the globe. Uh, my name is Mayashri Chinsami, and I am your project, uh, your program director um, for today. And perhaps just a few housekeeping rules uh, for all our participants to kindly keep your microphones and cameras on mute. Um, you are welcome to share comments and questions in the chat um, while the panelists are presenting. And uh, Ms. Walters will invite questions and comments after the panel have delivered their presentations. We are indeed honored to have your participation here today as we engage in an interactive panel discussion on indigenous knowledge systems in cultural and biological diversity conservation for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, this initiative today is a joint endeavor between the Center of Excellence in Indigenous Knowledge Systems based at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and the Sikh Human Rights Group, an NGO with consultative status at the United Nations. Um, just allow me to quickly share with you um, a presentation on a little bit of background on the um, CIKS. Um, let's see this, if we can. All right. Um, the Center for Indigenous Knowledge Systems is a partnership of five um, South African higher education institutions, uh, that being the University of KwaZulu Natal, which serves as the hub, the Northwest University, University of South Africa, University of Limpopo, and the University of Venda. And in 2004, the South African government um, put forward an ICAS policy, which came um, into being uh, and which looked at um, institutions of higher education to be uh, the drivers and the vehicles through which IKS or indigenous knowledge systems could be uh, promoted, protected and preserved. So uh, these institutions that form uh, CIKS have identified um, indigenous knowledge systems as a way of transforming their core business, that being research, teaching, learning, and community engagement. Um, I think one of the questions we'd need to ask is why was the um, CIKS established um, and as a hub for advancing indigenous knowledge systems? And this was um, based on the realization that in spite of the fact that a large proportion of our population and our communities still depend on our knowledge systems uh, as part of our livelihood, um, our history in terms of slavery, colonialism, and apartheid, which is um, here in South Africa, and other forms of imperialism, we tended to have marginalized our knowledge systems um, as a knowledge system in its own merit. So therefore, um, uh, as part of implementing um, this uh, national imperative uh, through the IKS policy, these higher education institutions were mandated to uh, advance IKS as a new area of inquiry. Um, more recently, more than 20 heads of um, African higher education institutions and autonomous research institutions from Francophone, Anglophone, and Lusophone countries signed an MOU to establish the UNESCO Category 2 African Institute in Indigenous Knowledge Systems, which basically shares or shows showcases the impetus of advancing Indigenous knowledge systems. And these are the higher education institutions. Um, so the consortium um, has a range of advantages and, and this forms part of the relationship that we have established and the collaboration that we have with the Sikh Human Rights um, Group, which is part of providing a cross-cultural, linguistic and international platform where we can engage very openly on indigenous knowledge systems research, any human capital, develop, um, human capital development, any sort of networking that we're looking forward to, as well as community engagement. It also brings together, like um, we have our colleagues, Bethan and Carlos, have been working with a lot of the youth networks, uh, researchers, postgraduate students, and other stakeholders from both public and private sectors um, to come together as part of implementing or realizing the aspirations of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we also look at what are the existing potentialities within these entities. So yourselves as youth networks, as researchers, as community knowledge holders, we're looking at what the potentialities are there as part of this online interactive engagement 
to see how we can transform some of the uh, initiatives and localize the SDGs. And in so doing, some of the activities include the harnessing and promotion of our indigenous, indigenous languages, as well as homegrown philosophies, as these are repositories, these are spaces, these, these living archives of our knowledge. Um, we're also looking at, uh, as part of the consortium, uh, to systematize. There's a lot of uh, activities that are going along, and we'd like to also coordinate and systematize uh, the knowledge systems that we have in our very diverse uh, cultures uh, within the continent and outside. Um, and then also, uh, I think very much or very importantly today, we're going to see how there is importance of complementarity of knowledge systems um, and how indigenous knowledge systems can contribute to that complementarity so that we have a very common understanding on what uh, we're hoping to achieve. Um, so I, I think with that, I'd like to welcome our partners at the Sikh Human Rights Group um, as they facilitate the panel discussion this morning. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as previously mentioned, my name is Carlos Arbuthnot, and I'm a human officer and project coordinator at the Sikh Human Rights Group. Uh, and I'd just like to thank everyone again for attending this online discussion. Um, so where to begin? Um, for those of you who aren't aware, and in the words of uh, Gleb Ragodeski, um, the rapid rise in the world's population and our ever-growing dependence on fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel-based modes of production, has played a considerable role in the growing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As a result, global temperatures are increasing, the sea level is rising, and precipitation pat patterns are changing. While storms surge, floods, droughts, and heat waves are becoming more frequent and severe, Subsequently, agricultural production is decreasing, fresh water is becoming more scarce, infectious diseases are on the rise, and local livelihoods are being degraded and human well-being is being diminished. Although Indigenous groups' low-carbon traditional ways of life have contributed little to climate change, Indigenous peoples are the most adversely affected by it, and this is largely a result of their historic dependence on local biological diversity, ecosystem services and cultural landscapes as sources uh, of, of sustenance and well-being. The very identity of Indigenous peoples is inextricably linked uh, with their lands, which are located predominantly at the social ecological mar margins of human habitation, such as small islands, tropical forests, high altitude zones, coast, desert margins, and uh, of course the circumpolar Arctic. Here at these margins, the consequences of climate change include effects on agriculture, pastoralism, fishing, hunting and gathering, and other subsistence activities, including access to water. Indigenous peoples, however, are not mere victims of climate change, comprising only 4% of the world's population, between 250 to 300 million people, they utilize 22% of the world's land service. In doing so, they maintain 80% of the planet's biodiversity in or adjacent to 85% of the world's protected areas. Indigenous lands also contain hundreds of gigatons of carbon, a recognition that is gradually drawn, uh, dawning on industrialized countries that seek to secure significant carbon stocks in an effort to mitigate the climate change. With connective knowledge of the land, sky and sea, these people are excellent observers and interpreters of changes in the environment. The ensuing community-based and collectively held knowledge offers valuable insights complementing scientific data with chronological and landscape specific precision and the detail um, that is crucial for verifying climate models and evaluating climate change scenarios developed by scientists at much broader spatial and temporal scale. Moreover, indigenous knowledge providers, uh, sorry, indigenous knowledge provides a crucial foundation for community-based adaptation and mitigation actions that sustain resilience for social ecological systems at the interconnected local, regional, and global scales. While unprecedented climate change poses a, gr a growing threat to the survival of indigenous peoples, more often than not, they continue to be excluded from the global processes of decision and policy making, such as official UN climate change negotiations that are defining ours and their future. 
The consequences of such marginalization are that many global, globally sanctioned programs aimed at mitigating the impacts of climate change, such as mega dam projects constructed under the Clean Development Mechanisms Framework, further exasperate the direct impacts of climate change on indigenous people, undermining their livelihoods even more. In addition, poorly designed and implemented climate change adaptation programs, for example, reducing emissions from deforestation and de degradation initiatives, often weaken customary rights of Indigenous peoples to their lands and natural resources, impairing their resilience. Indigenous people are facing these escalating pressures at a time where their cultures and livelihoods are already exposed to the significant stresses of accelerated natural resource development in their traditional territories due to trade liberalisation and globalisation. Therefore, during this interactive discussion, I'd be most grateful if you could bear the following questions in mind, uh, which will be available in the group chat in just a moment. What are the limitations of Indigenous knowledge and practices in climate change adaptation and mitigation? What role can the youth play in promoting and protecting Indigenous knowledge systems in cultural and biological diversity conservation for climate change adaptation and mitigation? And finally, do you believe that there is scope to integrate Indigenous and or traditional knowledge systems from around the globe into your country's or your state um, government's domestic legislation, policy and practice, particularly in regards to what now, was now become a global effort to mitigate and adapt to the negative impacts of climate change? Um, thank you very much. I'm now going to give the floor to uh, Professor Hassan Kaya who is the director of the DSI NRF Centre of Excellence in Indigenous Knowledge Systems. Professor Kaya, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Good afternoon, everybody. As Carlos pointed out, my name is Hassan Kaya. I am the director of the DSI NRF Centre of Excellence in Indigenous Knowledge Systems, which Dr. Simsami gave a brief outline. I mean, my presentation today is to share with you, I hope everybody can hear me properly, one of the issues which tends to be marginalized in the climate change and adaptation discourse, and that is the role of African indigenous knowledge systems in cultural and biological diversity conservation. Because we tend to forget how culture and biological diversity conservation are linked to climate change, especially within the context of uh, adapt adaptation and mitigation. Can you put a second, actually uh, whoever is hearing. If you look at, for instance, indigenous people across the world and cultures and ecological settings, <laughs> They interact with the natural environment for sustainable livelihood, and they depend on the natural environment in terms of health, food security, natural resource conservation, and all other aspects of life. And in the process of surviving in those different ecosystems, they develop different ways of life in terms of culture, in terms of values, and also because of the long observation and experimentation with the natural behavior, they develop lived experiences on how the how culture, biodiversity influence climate change and how they adapt themselves to those climatic changes to suit their own ways of life. Indigenous communities recognize that social practices, that is culture, influence the biodiversity conservation through the selection of the type of plants they need for life, for housing, the insects, animals, as food sources of food security, and also take into consideration how these lived experiences and knowledge systems impact on the environmental uh, health care. And they also realize that because they depend on those uh, natural resources, they are very sensitive on the aspect that over exploitation of these natural resources in terms of their biodiversity 
contribute to the environmental degradation, loss of cultural and biological diversity. And the most important thing is that they realize that the symbiotic relation between culture, biodiversity, and climate change, and also the indigenous environmental knowledge systems, which arise out of the cultural biology, biodiversity and climate change symbiotic relationship. So that demonstrates that uh, the concept of Western sustainable science is not a new phenomenon among indigenous people because it's part and parcel of their daily lives that if they destroy any part of this symbiotic relationship, it affects their livelihood. Therefore, indigenous knowledge systems realize the interdependence between culture, biological diversity, and climate change adaptation, which also tends to be neglected in the climate change adaptation and biodiversity discourse and also policy development. And that's why we want to share with you our views regarding this symbiotic relationship between culture, indigenous knowledge, and biological diversity in the context of climate change, adaptation, and conservation. And I said before, the, these indigenous people and communities, including here in Africa, they are located in areas where the majority of the world is biological and cultural resources are found, including also linguistic diversity, because it is through languages that they express the relationship to the environment and there's also their own cultural ways of life. And these indigenous languages, as uh, Dr. Chen Simon was pointing out, they're not mere communication tools, but they're also repositories of these knowledge systems related to the environmental health care and also that symbiotic relationship between uh, culture, biodiversity, and the climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Can you continue the other stuff? So I was emphasizing the question of African indigenous knowledge systems and how indigenous communities, taking an example here in Africa, they are trying to use indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous languages to localize the sustainable development goals, because that is one question which is always being asked, how do indigenous knowledge systems, especially in the context of Africa here, help to mitigate and also to localize the sustainable development goals? Because if you look at the, the, the 17 UN sustainable development goals, the issue of culture and indigenous knowledge is not very well clearly stated. If you look at for the SDG 14, conserve and sustainable use of oceans, on also 15, question of restoring and promoting sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, the focus is only on biodiversity conservation. There is very little being talked about indigenous knowledge system and also the issue of culture. And in our promotion of indigenous knowledge system, especially in Africa, the issue of culture is very, very important. Especially, especially the issue of languages, because one of the aspects of the sustainable development is that nobody should be left behind. And this means that if the sustainable development goals are to be relevant and accessible to the marginalized people who are mostly in the developing countries, they cannot run away from the issue of indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous languages, because most of the people in these areas especially in the rural and marginalized communities, especially women and children and girls, they depend very much on these indigenous knowledge system and languages for their daily livelihood. So the exclusion and marginalization threaten the central tenant, as I said, of the 2013 agenda to leave no one behind. And the assessment of the the achievement of the sustainable development will be just in how much inclusive they are, and especially the contribution and their impact on the livelihood of indigenous communities who depend on these cultural and biological uh, diversity for livelihood. 
in the situation of climate change. So uh, continue my whoever sharing. So for instance, if you look at that in order for promote environmental and health and sustainability, the issue of climate change needs a lot of consideration on the issue of indigenous knowledge systems and the climate change. And if this can only be achieved through the inclusion of community leaders, because these people in their communities, they have got their own leader, including the knowledge holders who are the custodians of indigenous knowledge and uh, languages. And as I said, these are repositories of knowledge on the environmental health care and other aspects of the symbiotic relation between culture, indigenous knowledge, and bio diversity for climate change adaptation. And also, as Dr. Chinsami pointed out, the question of youth, but why are the youth increasingly becoming aware of the impact of climate change on ecosystems and leveraging on their digital and artistic knowledge and skills? They can use this knowledge as part and parcel of the complementarity of knowledge systems because in the chat in which you responded to a diversity of questions we asked on the topic today, there is a big interest in how diversity in terms of culture and in terms of languages, in terms of biodiversity contribute to mitigation and adaptation of climate change. So we have young people from the developed world and developing world a developing world, and through exchange of experiences, you have responses from India, from Africa here, and Africa is a continent. You have also South Africa and other parts of the continent. As we pointed out, we are now working with people from Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone. We are going to do so. Young people, through their digital knowledge and skills, can create research programs, research activities to exchange knowledge and experiences and how in their specific countries, in their specific ecosystems and cultural environment, linguistic mitigate and adapt to the challenges of climate change. So this discussion today pro provides an opportunity for young people across the world, across continents and cultures to work together to exchange experiences, how the symbiotic relation between culture, indigenous knowledge, and biodiversity meet, help to mitigate and adapt to climate change and how people as indigenous people uh, living in a way of globalization try to adapt to different climatic changes and how relevant their indigenous knowledge systems uh, adapt to the new conditions and how through the complementarity of knowledge systems, including the role of uh, digital knowledge and skills can help these communities across the world to adapt and mitigate climate change. So youth, as both as experts of the digital and artistic knowledge and skills, can contribute greatly to policy development in the context of climate change and climate change mitigation and the role of indigenous knowledge. Continue. So I would like also, as I said, I'm pointing, uh, my focus is on African indigenous knowledge and culture and biodiversity in African, African indigenous languages. There are a number of examples in the continent and because of limited time, I also would like to share only a few of them, whereby people in African countries especially indigenous communities and governments are now trying to, to localize the SDGs using African indigenous knowledge systems, homegrown philosophies and languages. An example is in Rwanda. There is a best practice in the continent and in the world where they are using indigenous languages and also indigenous knowledge systems to localize the sustainable development goals to ensure that they are understood and owned by the people who are involved in the implementation of the sustainable development goals. If you look at, for instance, in, in Rwanda, 
uh, policy environment and the institutional arrangements for promoting and localizing the SDGs, the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning is mandated to facilitate the ownership process. You'll find in Rwanda, they've got different programs based on homegrown philosophies, whereby, for instance, every part of time of the or end of the month or the beginning of the month, they have activities which involves all uh, stakeholders, including government leaders, to clean the environment, to plant uh, trees and other activities to ensure that the environment is cared for and also to ensure that there is mitigation of against climate change effects. So they are using local knowledge. This is Uganda, in Rwanda, they have one knowledge, one language, the Kenya Rwanda, which brings all people together. And they've got a lot of homegrown philosophies based on indigenous knowledge, which they use to mobilize people to adapt and mitigate against the effects of climate change. And also another example, that's just the same thing I was talking about the different homegrown philosophies in, 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 in Rwanda, Omuganda, working together, all those are philosophies which people, the government uses to mobilize people uh, uh, against the impacts of climate change. Another example, can, can you go to the next one, is uh, <clears throat> in Malawi, where Malawi is also one of the best examples in the continent, whereby the SDGs are translated in African indigenous languages for localization. In 2018, for instance, the government of Malawi, through the Department of Information and the Ministry of Economic Planning and Development, in conjunction with the Malawi Office of United Nations, embarked on a project to translate the SDGs into different local languages, Chichewa, Tumbuka, and Yao, and also the other languages in Malawi, in order to ensure that the document, the sustainable development are understood by all the people, especially in the rural areas, so that they can implement the SDGs sustainably and uh, based on their own homegrown philosophies and their local conditions where they live. The citizens cannot hold public officials accountable on an agenda in which they don't understand. So in order to ensure that the policymakers are held accountable by the people, they must also ensure that they understand the SDGs in their local languages and translate them into their own knowledge systems for implementation for their own benefit. So localization of the SDGs increases ownership and accountability on the part of the citizens, and also it helps also in the monitoring of their country's performance on all the SDG indicators. I think I should stop there. Thank you. Carlos. Sorry. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jasev uh, Singh Rai. I'm the director of the Sikkim Rights Group. I'm following on from uh, Professor Kaya. Uh, our organization was uh, set up in 1985, uh, and the first decade we concentrated on uh, human rights uh, documentation, etc. But then we diversified into many other areas uh, from 98 onwards into the environment when we attended the World Conference on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002. Um, and then uh, subsequently, I met uh, two people who have also influenced our policy quite substantially. One is uh, Professor Daryl Mesa and then Professor Kaya. Um, in our, one of the things that stuck us when we went to a, a conference at uh, Bangkok when Daryl Mesa was in uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, was that the whole environmental and climate uh, uh, discourse uh, was based on one civilization <clears throat> and uh, uh, its uh, um, solutions, uh, which were more technical, which was also about custodianship uh, of this earth, 
uh, and uh, which was uh, based on uh, concepts of fear and things of that of, of the future. Um, we thought that uh, uh, that around the world, the world uh, essentially the world has uh, successfully uh, managed to have a sustainable uh, approach to environment for thousands of years. But in the last hundred years, all this has broken down. Uh, there seems to be a lot of knowledge which has uh, gone amiss, uh, which has been marginalized, uh, which uh, has lost currency in the uh, current uh, uh, knowledge systems uh, and world uh, discourse on environment and climate. And uh, so we took a position that needs to be a plural approach to uh, at least the environmental issue because uh, uh, it's the biggest existential uh, threat now to, our, to survival of the human uh, beings in future, uh, in the near future, uh, rather than just the future. Uh, and uh, we've had a number of conferences uh, in Durban as well, uh, with Professor Kaya, and uh, a lot of inputs from uh, Professor Darrell Mesa. So, uh, 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 so this is a part of that series in, uh, in which, uh, as uh, Professor Kaya has very eloquently uh, said, and it falls in line with our uh, philosophy, uh, that uh, there has to be a plural approach to the environment. There has to be respect for indigenous systems. And I quite agree with him that the SDGs, uh, in, in a way, the, the, the whole, uh, uh, the, uh, the way the SDGs are presented, uh, they have been chosen, uh, seem to ignore the wealth of uh, knowledge that already exists uh, within uh, not only indigenous people in many civilizations around the world. And it continues to be a, uh, an approach which is uh, slightly universalist in its, uh, uh, in its context. Uh, and I think it would be, you know, I'm quite happy to say today that perhaps there should, should be a SDG 18, which concentrates on knowledge systems uh, plural knowledge systems on uh, environment and all that. So thank you very much, Professor Kaya. Um, and um, I think we go on to the next session of, uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rai. Yeah. We can now open up the floor if anyone has any questions at all um, for either Professor Rai um, or rather Dr. Rai or Professor Kaya. Um, you can either pop it in the chat or you can pop your hand up and um, say it yourself. If not, I do have pre-planned questions from um, people who couldn't make it, so. Okay, while people are thinking of questions, I'm sure, um, I will ask the questions that have been sent in for pe from people who can't make it. Um, so the first one is, how strongly do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Indigenous communities might be vulnerable to the impact of climate change, but have also over the years through, um, through lived experience developed rich knowledge and skills on climate change adaptation and mitigation in their specific culture and um, ecolog uh, ecologic communities. So, Kaya, uh, you, oh, Professor Kaya, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, personally, I want to uh, respond to that question of vulnerability of indigenous people and communities. I think they've been attended, I attended, I had the privilege of attending uh, these COP for climate change. And one of the aspects you notice there is to look at these indigenous communities as just vulnerable. I don't say that they're not vulnerable because climate changes and also challenges and all the systems, they live in, a, I mean, sensitive ecosystems, especially now with the issues of industrialization, the patterns in which they're used to, to, to into, I mean, to, to, uh, to know the early warning system will have changed, but we shouldn't look at in indigenous communities and people just as vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they're part and parcel of what is happening globally. 
because we live in a global world, what happens in America or in England there or in China, or in one or the other direct or indirect will affect them in their, in their what? I mean, they live in areas where they don't contribute much to, to carbon what emissions, but yet they're, they're involved. But at the same time, as I pointed out in my presentation, they have for years lived, experimented, observed the natural environment and developed a number of ways of adapting and mitigating the impacts of climate change. So we shouldn't just look at them as ten the tendency in Western countries to look at them, first of all, as homogeneous, as uh, Dr. Rai was pointing, that there is a plurality among the, the, the indigenous uh, communities because they live in different ecosystems, they develop different cultural uh, ways of living and the different ways of responding to the environment. In spite of being vulnerable to the, to the impacts of, of globalization and climate change, but at the same time, they have also their own ways of adapting and mitigating to, uh, to the, mitigating the impact of climate change. So we shouldn't look at that way as they're being portrayed, that they're just there to be helped, they don't have anything to contribute. That is not right. They have lived with the environment over centuries and they survive in those environments. That's why they respect that environment. They develop values and different ways of ensuring the environment remains healthy for their sustainability. So why they are victims of the impact of globalization, but at the same time, they have their own ways to adapt to those environmental challenges and that's why we emphasize, that's why the young people have to come in there to ensure that we help these people to complement their existing knowledge of the environment together with the new ways of knowing in terms of technologies. That's why Dr. Ray was talking about the plurality of knowledge systems. We need a kind of a democracy of knowledge systems we need epistemic, global epistemic data so that we live as a human being, we can complement one another and knowledge systems become, diversity becomes an asset rather than a liability. So it's not a question of just being vulnerable. They have also a contribution to global environmental healthcare. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rai, would you like to add anything to that or should I move on to the next question? You're on mute. Professor Kaya has uh, sort of answered it very eloquently. I don't think there's more to add. Yeah, go on. Um, next question. Okay, brilliant. So the next question is um, coming from maybe the audience are from the UK and maybe North America. But can you please explain why it is important to recognize that looking at the environmental issues from um, countries who measure their success from their GDP or through this kind of colonial gaze that we've brought, been brought up with is not only counterproductive, especially when it comes to tackling the various issues surrounding climate change, but also why this kind of colonial mentality is also a bar to tackling the many issues surrounding diversity um, and inclusion towards the environmental issues. Um, Dr. Rai, do you want to start with this one? Okay. Um, yes, I think uh, I think uh, we um, human society uh, seems to have um, uh, sort of obsessed itself, itself with the growth rather than contentment. Um, you know, for a long time, people sought to live in communities and societies and even little villages or even bigger cities, uh, but their focus was about. Um, not necessarily happiness, but uh, about uh, con being contented and uh, being uh, being at ease with each other and all that, and with the environment. Uh, and environment was very much part of it. Uh, but uh, for the last uh, century, uh, uh, countries are competing with each other on GDP growth. And a lot of uh, effort is put on growth, uh, which means uh, digging your natural resources, uh, and, um, you know, um, and, and the, the, in some countries where they have uh, big spreads of natural forest, uh, doing away with forest, uh, encroaching on that. Uh, uh, and 
uh, and so on, uh, where we are producing more than our needs, uh, producing excess so much, in, in fact, so much waste. And secondly, we're not looking at uh, things uh, and how we are going to recycle them or dispose them. Uh, I think there needs to be a bit of a change in emphasis uh, 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 that uh, is GDP and this uh, colonial approach to growth, the only way forward for human beings, human life. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Professor Kai, would you like to add to Yeah, I, I would like to add you to what uh, Dr. Rice said. You see, if you look at, for instance, not only Africa here as a continent, but also other developing countries, including sorry, India. Sorry, Professor Kaya, can you please put your camera on? Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, hope you can see me now. My camera is on. Can you see me? But I can see your name. Okay, I mean, I'm just trying to add to what Dr. Ray said regarding the issue of culture and uh, environment in the context of uh, climate change. If you look at, for instance, our continent here in Africa and other developing countries which have been colonized, has been the impact has been the question of epistemic injustice, whereby because of the slavery, colonization, globalization, and the other forms of imperialism, our indigenous knowledge systems, including values and our relation to environment were marginalized, being looked as unscientific. And there was a time when people thought that before coming of Europeans, Africans had no history, no knowledge systems, but the archeological and historical evidence shows differently that there was a lot of knowledge development and innovations taking place in the continent before the coming of Europeans. So colonization brought cultural knowledge arrogance. There's, there's only one way of knowing while we are propagating the complementarity and democracy of knowledge systems in the global pool of knowledge, especially with regard to the search of sustainable solutions to global challenges, including the COVID-19 we are facing to today. That we've seen that Western knowledge doesn't have all the solutions to our challenges because they're not just biological, they're also social, cultural, challenges is social economic inequality. And these may require the complementarity of knowledge systems so that we have a kind of a global epistemic justice. That is one. Another aspect which is connected with the question of culture and environmental ethics is the question of Western arrogance, including the United Nations itself, or universalizing ethics. I remember the first conference we had with Rai, Derry, and the other people we had here in Durban was on the question of, 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 of the challenges of universalization of environmental ethics. And our argument is the fact that if you want people to respond to conserve their environment, you must also look at their cultural values. How do people react to the environment? So people react different to the environment, and that brings also the importance of culture. But Western knowledge systems and cultural arrogance brought the idea that their values are universal, their standards of, of relating to environment, whereas you see you've lived in Europe for 20 years, there are more in Germany and the whole Europe there, about moving around. You find the whole environment has been destroyed, industrialization, the impact of industrial globalization. Whereas until today, the largest number of biodiversity is located in those areas where indigenous people and communities live. Therefore, the question of climate change mitigation and, and adaptation needs to take also the cultural diversity. The plurality of diversity of cultures, which goes hand in hand with the plurality of knowledge systems and the diversity as Western countries have always taken to be a problem, including here in South Africa here, culture was diversity was looked as a problem. We are propagating in our center here, cultural diversity and knowledge systems are an asset. So when different knowledge systems come together to look at the solution for COVID-19, to look at this, 
the, the solutions for, uh, for environmental degradation, environmental uh, climate change impact, whatever. Different knowledges could be seek knowledge, pseudo knowledge, and other knowledge, either from Latin or wherever, or different cultures live, and now we have digitization. We share knowledge system like we are doing together now to find sustainable solutions to global challenges, including adaptation and mitigation against climate change. So the issue of culture is very important. And if you want people to conserve, respect the environment, you must also respect their cultures because there are relationships to the environment, natural environment is something to do that symbiotic relation that I talked about on how we relate to environment, cultural and in terms of ethics. Thank you. Thank you, uh, that was excellently put. Um, so we have a question from someone in the audience. Um, so Josephine has asked, um, so how can indigenous knowledge systems in the UK be further integrated into our government's environmental policy? So maybe Dr. Rai, would you like to go first? Yeah, perhaps I can come on that one also. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, that's right. Shall I go on? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, um, I think just as uh, the religious cur curriculum and uh, cultures are uh, in the diversity curriculum, uh, the various cultures are are, are taught. Uh, various religions are taught in schools. I think it's time to teach uh, children. Uh, the diversity of uh, indigenous knowledge systems uh, in regard to the environment and how uh, societies have successfully uh, managed to conserve and recycle uh, anything they produce and how they do it and uh, their no uh, or the, the, the depth of knowledge they have, the wisdoms they have about the environment. I think it will make people think about uh, how they approach uh, 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 modern technology and production. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the big differences between our society now and society a hundred years ago, and I think in many indigenous uh, societies is that they always think of the end product as well. Where will it end? Uh, where, where, how will it be recycled? Or how will it... Uh, uh, go back into the environment or be disposed of. Whereas our, our society over the last hundred years hasn't really been thinking about that. So we put a lot of the, we've dumped it in this oceans and seas, we've dumped it into landfills, uh, we've made a mess of cities. I, th I think if people are taught how different societies have have uh, had very successful approaches to this. It might make people think, yeah, I think there should be a, a, a plural uh, uh, plurality of uh, knowledge is taught in schools, yeah. Thank you. Um, Professor Kaya, would you like to go? Yeah, I mean, I wanted first of all to start with the, it could be an argument, that every knowledge is basically local. So in other ways, even in Western countries, what we call now standard Westernized knowledge system are initially historically local. It's only through colonization, other people made their knowledge systems, which are basically local, they made them universal. So power relations, as I said, it is also a question of epistemic injustice. There is also traditional knowledge in Europe. We always give an example with Mahashiri. We had a couple of uh, French students here who came, who spent some time with us here. They only thought indigenous knowledge or traditional, what you call traditional local knowledge was only an African or a First Nation thing. There is so much traditional knowledge in Europe, in, Germany, in England, whatever. People use indigenous ways of making cheese, indigenous making ways of making bread, indigenous ways of, of, of social practices. 
of horses, but they don't call them indigenous or traditional because they associate those concepts with the primitive or what, in the cultural anthropology, which came with the colonization here, that is only cultural anthropology of, 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 of Luos or Kosa Zulus, but it's no cultural anthropology of Germans, whatever, things like that. But what I'm trying to say here, just as we have indigenous knowledge here, knowledge systems, there are so much indigenous knowledge systems in all communities in Europe. I lived there more than 20 years. I know what I'm talking about. There's so many indigenous knowledge. And these also can, through the complementarity of knowledge systems, through the democracy knowledge systems, they can work together. There's so much Europe in terms of knowledge system can learn from Latin American indigenous communities or First Nations in Canada, Native Americans, or here in Africa with the all more than 2,000 ethnic cultural groupings here. In other ways, what it amplifies knowledge is in all societies is basically local, but because of the history of colonization and imperialism, other knowledge systems became dominant and now they are looked at universal, but basically they are also local and they can contribute to this global pool of knowledge, this complementarity, this global epistemic justice where all knowledge are equal and they can be pulled together to come up with sustainable solutions to global challenges, including climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, both of you. So the next question will go in, it's in the um, chat if you need to refer back to it um, from Summer, but it's the first bit is um, how can edu educational uh, policies incorporate indigenous knowledge into the curriculum in all countries? Professor Kai, would you like to go first? Uh, can you come on with that one? Uh, so it's in the chat if you need to go back, but it's um, how can educational policies incorporate indigenous knowledge into the curriculum in all countries? Yeah, I mean, I can give examples of our own here in South Africa, whereby since 2001, through my own efforts and colleagues, we have managed to develop indigenous knowledge systems, teaching and research programs from undergraduate up to PhD level and other countries, um, sorry, not other uh, partners of ours, University of Venda, and also here, we are trying to bring a postgraduate program here. We have a number of our postgraduates, graduates who are working all over to ensure that indigenous knowledge goes into the curriculum. And especially in South Africa here, we have one advantage in the sense that historically, the teaching and learning programs of indigenous knowledge systems were started by higher education institutions located in the rural areas, whereby it gives students and learners that the advantage, the opportunity to interact with the communities so that you mitigate that disjuncture between learning and living. Okay? Disjuncture between theory and practice. We invite indigenous knowledge holders as farmers, as traditional uh, health practitioners, as midwives to come in the classroom and share their knowledge, which has been mitigated, will be despised by the students. It's nice when a child or a student sees his or her grandmother in the classroom talking about traditional knowledge. Okay? To see your grandmother talking about the different ways, indigenous ways of early warning systems and indicators of climate change. It gives the students a kind of a self-confidence that the knowledge which our parents, which our elders in the community have a currency in the educational system. And also it gives, a, a, learners, the opportunity to interact, to learn different ways of imparting knowledge, which have been used by people over centuries and marginalized by the colonial educational systems, which were looked as unscientific, but these are the knowledge systems which our people use every day, but we are not taken seriously. And we are making, we're ensuring through the educational programs we have developed here, recognized by the South African Qualification Authority, have a currency in the decolonization of our educational system. So we have also uh, taken initiative, as I said, we have now a consortium of 20 higher education institutions in the continent. And they are among the things we have developed in terms of roadmaps for the Institute is to integrate 
African indigenous knowledge systems in the curriculum. African indigenous knowledge systems, including their methodologies, their research methodologies, whereby you don't look at the knowledge holders, the people in the communities, just object of research, but as the main knowledge holders, uh, the ones who know. Eh? Traditional medicine is not in the laboratory, it is outside there. So there is this symbiotic relation between the community and the laboratory, the community and the institution. So it gives the students opportunity to mitigate, as I said, that's this juncture between learning and living. So it's not something we're talking just in theory. We have already started here in South Africa and through our consortium of higher education institutions in the continent, we want to ensure that all African higher education institutions and schools have IKS learning and teaching programs. And also you find that South Africa is one of the first countries in the continent in 2004 to adopt a national IKS policy. And 2019, South Africa came with an IKS Act to protect, preserve, and promote African indigenous knowledge systems as part of the sustainable development of the country and the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Ryan now and maybe have more of a take from uh, a UK perspective where, I mean, for myself personally, learning about indigenous knowledge systems was um, non-existent until um, university level. And that was because I studied international relations. Um, so how do you think it could be adapted into maybe the UK or just Europe in general um, and North American kind of curriculum? Yeah. Um... As I, I think, as I said uh, we, before, we, we uh, learn about different cultures and religions, but I think we don't learn about different knowledge systems and we don't learn about uh, uh, particularly uh, about different uh, uh, knowledge systems in regard to the environment. Uh, it, it was, uh, 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 I think there's one or two universities such as Royal Holloway who are looking at this, but they're looking in context of uh, South America and uh, other countries were not uh, incorporating that into curriculums into this country yet. Uh, I think it'd be useful if there's more research uh, undertaken in universities here and it became part of the, uh, the teaching, especially at the undergraduate level uh, and at the school level about how different, uh, different uh, civilizations, cultures, and uh, uh, geographical re uh, regions uh, have dealt with the environment in the past um, and continue, do so, continue to do so outside the government. I think one of the things that after colonialism that happened was countries went into a bit of an overdrive into identity, identity nationalism, for instance, having a flag and making sure there is a national language which is from their own uh backgrounds uh and having some little tinkering in the constitutions but the knowledge the essential knowledge system remained uh the same and from essentially from the west uh i think if uh, what, what uh, professor kaya has very successfully done uh, over the last few decades is convinced uh, not only the south african government but other governments uh, in Africa to uh, look at indigenous knowledge systems and incorporate that into curriculums, not, uh, not only at the school level, but university. And I think you, you sort of set up a, a module for the civil service as well in South Africa, as I understand. And something like this can be done in Europe, can be done in uh, UK, and for them to look at if, especially in international relations, if more countries were to... Uh, more countries out, uh, outside uh, Europe in other, other regions of the world uh, were to uh, be quite strong in it, indigenous knowledge systems and it would be part of uh, any uh, international relations course to understand those in, and, uh, understand, and uh, learn them, yeah. Uh, thank you both, that was really um, informative. I'll um, pass over to Daryl now, he's got his hand up. I'm not sure, can I? I can't unmute you, but if someone can unmute Daryl, um, oh, there we go. I can unmute myself, I think. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you both, Hassan and um, 
Jazdiv and Ben and Carlos, thank you for your, all your work. It's very interesting, this forum. The question here, I thought another aspect on the educational integration, and this also raises questions for both of the speakers as well, is one is the role of linguistic diversity in the rediscovery of indigenous knowledge. I think uh, language is connected to um, the way we think and our epistemology. So one question for uh, Hassan and Maya Shi is that in the uh, Durban case, how is uh, linguistic diversity taught as a method for development of indigenous knowledge and also indigenous thinking? Uh, and for Justif, how is uh, what's the UK situation in terms of teaching Indigenous language? I know there is uh, some Welsh and some Scottish and some Gaelic and Irish, but how do we regard that? And an additional question in the role of the Sikh Human Rights Group is interesting. Um, and in British culture as a colonial culture, it's sort of interesting the diversity. Uh, where you're speaking from in Southall is a lot of, large number of uh, people from the South Asian continent. In a sense, I think there's a role also for teaching of indigenous knowledge to people of the diaspora who have been separated and brought up in a colonial sense. How do we see that, um, that role? Uh, in my experience growing up in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, Maori language is integral to the thinking. Uh, and our uh, work in you know, American University of Sovereign Nations with the Apache community, in the Apache preschool level, um, Apache language is critical to this. But unfortunately, once they go to the mainstream uh, United States schools, it's largely based on English or American English, I should say. Um, so uh, some of my reflections, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daria. That was a very nice question. And is, in fact, it came at the right moment because we have now started here a very, very big project. The government also within the Sadak region especially supporting us. And that is the question of teaching African indigenous languages using other African languages. As you know, if you look at what's going on in the continent, Kiswahili, which is mostly spoken in Tanzania and other East African, Southern African countries, was adopted by the African Union as the lingua franca of the continent. And two years ago, the Southern African Development Community adopted also Kiswahili as the fourth language in the Southern African region besides French, Portuguese, and, and English. And we came up, with, not as a center, but now as an African Institute in Indigenous Knowledge Systems, with the idea that while we accept that Kiswahili should be the lingua franca of the continent, Africa is over 2,000 indigenous languages. Tanzania, they won 50, Nigeria, they 400. So, Kiswahili is 150 million speakers the worldwide. If you go in America, in Europe, in Japan, whatever, as I said before, we are working with the universities in Osaka, in Cancun, whatever, Cancun University. They are all teaching Kiswahili. But we said, no, Kiswahili should also help other African indigenous languages to grow, to reach the same global status. Why? Because these African indigenous languages, if you look, look at the Bantu languages in Southern and Eastern Africa, they are a cluster of languages. Just in Europe, we say the Germanic languages, Germany, uh, Dutch, uh, Norwegian, whatever. The cluster of languages, like the Bantu languages, they can cross pollinate one another. If, for instance, there is a word which has been lost in the, in, in, in Sizulu, but it still exists among the, the in, 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 in Seswana or in other languages. So by teaching Kiswahili or African languages in using other African languages, you can borrow concepts and ideas from one another. 
instead of borrowing a concept from English or whatever. Hmm? You, these languages which are related historically and culturally in terms of values, they can cross-pollinate one another. And beyond that, we also came with an idea now, which has been accepted by governments here. We are working with the Tanzanian High Commissioner in South Africa, that indigenous languages are not just mere communication tools. It's not only here, you go to the Native Americans, you go to the First Nation in Canada, you go to the Maoris in New Zealand, whatever there. Indigenous languages are repositories of knowledge systems, in terms of science, technology, value systems. And these can be turned into resources for cultural and economic diplomacy. You, we are doing that thing. We have hired here uh, students from the arts, from the music, who are putting these ideas we are propagating on indigenous language, not just by teaching them through the IKS teaching and learning programs, by also making merchandise. You see, there are so many philosophical what parallels which you can put in a t-shirt, which you can put in other ways, what we are promoting here, Derek, is not teaching an indigenous language in the classroom, but you can teach language by informal ways. Most of the spreading, when we were students in Germany, whatever, most of the language, the German language, which we also used in what in the classroom because they, in the, when we were students there, there was no much English there. But most of it, we learned German through interaction with the people outside. It's through merchandise. You can put different slogans there in Germany and in Swahili or in Germany and Maori there, whatever there. And you find that ordinary people learn. They are not interested in the grammar, but they're interested in the way they can communicate. So we are trying to promote that aspect. It's a big project here of teaching African indigenous languages using other African languages. We also went to, to where the Western countries can also learn. We told the Germans, why go to institute? Why should you teach Kiswahili or uh, using English? Why can't you teach Kiswahili using Germany? Hmm? Why can't you go to teach Germany using Kiswahili instead of using Korea is the same. They are teaching Kiswahili using what? English. Why can't you teach Korean using? You put a, 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 a phrase there, a, Tanzania, a, a, a Swahili phrase in Swahili and put also put it in, in Korean. So there is a kind of diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, where the Koreans learn Kiswahili and Kiswahili also learn the philosophy. Goten still teaches about German philosophy, Goten Shila. But why can't you in the process of teaching Kiswahili using a, a German or German using Kiswahili, you also teach our own indigenous philosophies in Africa. So that is a program we've started here and the acceptance is huge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rai, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think uh, Darren was asking you about uh, the experience in Britain. Um, I actually wasn't born here, so I don't have the uh, benefit of the school system. Like Professor Kai, I was born in Tanzania. Maybe the best people are. <laughs> but uh, And then migrated over here. Uh, but uh, I think I find that Britain, or especially England, has a slightly schizophrenic approach to uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, multiple languages, multilingualism. Uh, every few years, some politician will come up and say, if you're in England, you must learn English and everybody must speak English. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of programs going on where they allow um, uh, communities to have their own language uh, in schools, etc., but not necessarily as the operative language, but in uh, uh, as uh, O levels or A levels or um, in their cultural institutions. So there's no ban on that, uh, and uh, a lot of communities uh, fund that themselves with some funding from the government. Uh, there is, uh, of course, now movement in uh, Wales uh, where they are trying to. Uh, increase the, the use of Welsh language uh, more and more there. Uh, there's always this tension going on between England and, and Welsh there. They're, they're called Welsh uh, either extremist or nationalist uh, when they try and promote Welsh language. There's a big issue going on in Northern Ireland, as you know, um, with the, 
uh, the Sinn Féin trying to get uh, the Irish language to be uh, to be uh, made on par with English. Uh, that's also become a big political football there. Uh, so yeah, it's a sort of a, a mixed picture here. It, it's uh, very much tied to English nationalism at times, and uh, what is uh, uh, what uh, produces uh, uh, the votes at any time for politicians. Uh, there isn't, uh, and, and it will be interesting to see what happens in Europe now because England English is uh, an operative language in Europe. Um, with Brexit, uh, we don't know whether the French will suddenly say in a couple of years, well, why do we need English here? Um, that, uh, that's another conundrum which is uh, there. But I uh, agree with you that uh, through language, we connect to not only our communities, but also uh, emotionally to many other things, such as the environment, because language has a huge architecture in it, a lot of archaeology in it of uh, uh, meanings and context and uh, philosophies built into that, yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you both. Um, again, I'll open the floor up to any last questions, but while we're waiting for that, there's um, one more question here where, so how feasible do you believe the scope is to integrate indigenous and or traditional knowledge systems from around the globe into our domestic le legislation? policies and practice, particularly in regards to what must now become an international effort to mitigate and adapt um, the negative implications of climate change. Um, Professor Kai, would you like to start? Yeah, the question of integrating IKS into policies, South Africa has already started, they said, after democratic elections in 1994, you see, during the apartheid era, as I said before, diversity in terms of culture was looked as something, as a problem. That's why you had the apartheid policy and it was not in terms of race, but it was in terms of ethnicity, whereby you had the homeless system, including the universities were also in the homeless organized on terms of, 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 of ethnicity. But in 1994, after democratic elections, the new government democratic elections of Africa saw the importance of promoting indigenous knowledge systems. Because if you want to be an active citizenry, you must mobilize the knowledge systems. You must mobilize the values, as I said before, if you want somebody to preserve, conserve the environment, you must appeal to how he or she relates to the environment. You can understand it that way. So in 2004, the first meeting, I mean, of IKS conference, which contributed to the development of the IKS policy in 2004, we, I was part and parcel of organized. That's the early years when I came to South Africa here. So IKS is something which is part and parcel, one of the priority areas of South African development policy. The 2004 national IKS policy was also mandated to higher education institutions to promote or to develop a critical mass of, of, of human capital, which can promote the virtues, the importance of IKS in the development process. And in order to promote, to preserve and protect it, 2009 South African government, the government adopted the IKS act, including the recognition of prior learning. In other words, you recognize in terms of legally, the knowledge and virtues of African or indigenous knowledge systems. So it's already done here. And I was part of, I was leading the, the NEPAD, eh, New Economic Development Program of the, of the AU to ensure that the Southern African region had also mechanisms of introducing IKS as a policy. The region has almost 16 countries here. We moved around up to Seychelles to ensure that IKS as a policy is developed in these countries. So it's something which is already done in Africa here, South Africa in particular, and Southern region in particular, to ensure that indigenous knowledge becomes a policy. Because if you want indigenous knowledge, 
to become part of the development, sustainable development process, including the SDG, it must also be institutionalized. And how do you institutionalize the IKS is by making part, even here, the University of KwaZulu Natal in 2013, when I moved here, I, the first thing I ensured was to ensure that we have an African indigenous knowledge institutional policy. We could be the only university here in the continent or perhaps in the world with an institutional IK policy. So that it can also go in all areas of research, all areas of teaching and learning and in issues of community engagement, including knowledge property. So it's something going on here. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking what is already done. South Africa is in IKS national policies. So for the uh, University of KwaZulu Natal has an African indigenous knowledge systems institutional policy since 2013. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so Dr. Wright, same question, but how can we kind of follow in uh, South Africa's kind of footstep and implement it into our um, uh, legislation and policy and practice? You're on mute. I think what would help is uh, if um, um, uh, uh, the Institute, IKS Institute in uh, KwaZulu Natal, was also able to uh, show how this has been um, useful to the country and to the South Africans as well, uh, uh, other than. Uh, uh, just a, a, a react, reactive nationalism. And that, I think, will convince a lot of countries that uh, what Professor Kai has managed to achieve there in South Africa strengthens the country and the people and their, um, and their knowledge systems. And when that, is, uh, when that happens, I think, I think there is also a need for a uh, non-government organizations to push on that, push uh, for a diversity of knowledge systems, particularly in the environmental field. I, I think one of the sad things about uh, the NGO community is it is also fallen in line with the, the one single discourse in, in the climate and environmental fields. It also tends to uh, to uh, talk the same language, not in, I mean English, but uh, the technological language, the economic language. So you find a lot of NGOs uh, are trying to persuade uh, states that um, economically using alternatives to fossil fuel is just as effective and it's uh, just as beneficial rather than looking at uh, knowledge systems and value systems that people have had, they haven't been pushing on that. I think there needs to be some sort of a general awareness and, uh, and more campaigning on this. Then, then uh, I think uh, that, 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 that will be put into the ethics courses, uh, if nothing else, uh, in, uh, even in the West. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, both. I think that's covered all the questions that people have got to ask. Um, so that I'll maybe pass, I'll kind of end in thoughts really from maybe both of you is kind of, yeah, how um, to summarize is Indigenous knowledge systems kind of the answer to saving our planet and, and tackling climate, climate change, if you can answer that in maybe 30 seconds to a minute, which is a quite a big question. Professor Kai, would you like to give it a shot? Uh, sorry, uh, can you say it again? Um, so how are indigenous knowledge systems the answer to saving our planet um, and tackling kind of the issues that cl of climate change? Uh, you are asking me to give a kind of final word or what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, the final way, the most important thing as is pointed out is we must have a kind of a paradigm shift Am I a new mindset that we shouldn't look at diversity in terms of cultures, in terms of knowledge systems as a problem. We must look at it in the process of promoting global epistemic justice to look at diversity as a resource. Because the complementarity of knowledge systems, the democracy of knowledge systems 
in the global pool of knowledge, which was marginalized by the cultural arrogance of the West, should take into account that we have challenges which are global. In spite of this diversity, this diversity of knowledge system, we come together like we are doing today here. We have a problem of climate change. How to different knowledge systems based on cultural diversity can contribute to mitigate this global problem. We have COVID now. COVID is not just a biological issue. There are social, economic, cultural, political imperatives which came with the COVID. How do different knowledge systems, different cultures across the world, especially among young people, come together using the digital knowledge you have and skills to contribute to policy development, to contribute to changing mindsets among young people, the elderly, whatever, all diversity. Diversity is an asset now, must be looked among young people, not only within the context of climate change, adaptation and mitigation, but in all the challenges we are facing as human beings, poverty, epistemic injustice, human rights, all sorts of stuff. So we are here to propagate, or not propagate rather, to share knowledge and awareness on the importance of diversity. I remember you're the first, one of the first people who asked me when we first met, how does diversity come into climate change? And that's what we are trying to say today. Diversity is an asset for mitigating the impact of climate change, both in terms of environmental health and in terms of food security and all other aspects of our life. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, incredibly put. Um, Dr. Rai, would you like to kind of add to any of that at all? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, in English saying the proof is in the pudding, I think the evidence stands for itself. For thousands of years, human society has successfully managed to sustain itself. But in the last 100 years, when we, as a human society, decided we can be custodians of the world, we can control everything, uh, we are now looking uh, at an abyss that uh, everybody is fearing. We see fires everywhere, we see floods, and things like that. And um, uh, uh, but I, I think the other thing is uh, it's in the nature of every uh, empire or colonizer, whether it was the Romans or whether it was the Mughals in India, or whether it's uh, uh, the British colonialism, uh, to first learn local systems and then marginalize them and destroy them and replace them so that it can administrate and manage uh, that. Um, I, I think it's up to countries, uh, different regions, geographical regions, to push that back uh, and to recover uh, what was already there in our wisdoms. Uh, wisdom does not mean primitiveness. Uh, wisdom does not mean that we shun technology or do not use the car. Wisdom is uh, how we as uh, how we uh, integrate that and in, and in, into sustainability, into preserving the world, uh, we use uh, little bits of wisdom and how to let us say um, <clears throat> chart the the future of our children and things like that. We keep them uh, from mischief and things like that, and that's a greater wisdom that exists in many traditional systems which uh, needs to come forth now. It has to take over, and I think we have to. We have to be very blunt and say to all these people who are busy bodies going on in COP26, COP27 next year and everywhere, that look, you're the cause of this failure. You're not going to be the solution of this failure, disaster. The solution has to come from somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. That was, that was a really nice way to um, conclude. Our last little bit from Sikh Human Rights Group. Um, if you wanted to be involved in any internship or volunteering uh, programs, if you could pop your email in um, 
our group and I can kind of send you the relevant details. One intern we're specifically looking for is kind of an event coordinator. So anyone in marketing who can promote events like this, um, who's preferably based in the UK would be excellent. So again, if you show any interest or know other people, again, drop an email or uh, reach out to us on socials. I'll write that sort of stuff in the chat. Um, but otherwise that's it from Sea Community Rights Group. Um, if anyone else had anything else to say. Um, thanks, Bethan, um, Carlos, um, and to our panelists, uh, Professor Kaya and Dr. Rai. Um, and again, especially also to all the participants, um, it's, it's very um, refreshing, very enlightening to have these kind of engagements, especially coming from different parts of the world. Uh, so once again, this is not just an event. It's as, as Bethan has indicated, it's more of a, a continuing relationship amongst the networks. I hope you've managed to um, engage and, and find um, uh, some similarities and congruence in terms of your thoughts and, and activities going forward. So uh, once again, on behalf of um, the partners, we'd like to thank you for your participation and uh, we look forward to further engagement um, post this uh, workshop. Um, thank you and um, stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.